So uh, we are here today with Kendrick Vaughn, who earned his Bachelor of Science in Engineering and Management from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And then you went on to this respected, renowned Haas Business School. How are you today, Kendrick? I'm doing outstanding, Mia. It is such a pleasure to get a chance to catch up with you, and I thank you for making the time today. I am so glad that you could join us. And I know you said you're down there in Louisville, Kentucky, right? We out here in Louisville, Derby City, Brianna City. We out here in Louisville, uh -huh. Kentucky. Yes, ma'am. So there is a lot happening there right now. I, I tell you what, it's uh, 2020 has been a year. Mm -hmm. It has been a year. And to be here at this time in this moment, it, it means a lot. I mean, I feel like we are really getting a chance to feel um, a movement, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. I mean, it, it feels like you are living in the middle of a movement, and that's that's something pretty special. I'll remember this for the rest of my life. Yes, we technically are living in a movement, and in your new role, you have a critical place in that movement, right? Mm. In this new company that you're with right now, making sure that as we pivot as a country, our people can pivot, or people can pivot along with it. Yeah, so you know what's interesting is when I when I joined Breakline Education, the primary reason that I joined was that I felt like economic empowerment and uh, upward mobility, the ability to build generational wealth, is literally one of the biggest civil rights fights of our generation. And as you look at specifically the tech industry, which is growing, which is carrying the economy, which is um, literally redefining the way that we live life, it is so important that we have representation from, you know, the, the lowest levels of the company all the way up to the C-suite. And that honestly was what brought me to this opportunity that is Breakline Education. I mean, we are laser focused on trying to increase, um, you know, the number of black and brown faces that are in these organizations. And I think this is, this is the time, this is the moment. Um, and honestly, I'm just proud to be in the space um, during this time. Well, you, you have, when you've taken on this new role and you are making sure that this is happening, you're making sure that these companies, I looked at some of your partners there, you, you all are connected with some of the largest, uh, most, I guess, richest companies right now in the country. How have they been in terms of are they receptive to what you're doing? Mm. Are, you, are you finding it simple or is it a bit more difficult? Because making sure that there's a diverse population and a diverse pool is critical as we found out recently when, when Wells Fargo CEO said they aren't any. Mm. Yeah. You know what's so interesting? It's, it's so inter interesting that you mentioned that because before I answer your question, I want to kind of touch on what the Wells Fargo CEO said. And I, and I think that, you know, the, the reason I think this is so important is even in the short time that I've been in this role, I only joined this company in the beginning of September. Uh, in the short time that I've been in this space, I mean, I have seen a onslaught, just the outpour of diverse talent. And I mean, folks have been coming. I mean, these are just amazing human beings that are coming and saying, hey, we want to be in this space. And um, you know, to be able to just see that firsthand and realize that there's still so much ignorance that's out there at these high, high levels. And it's not even so much about the ignorance. I, it's not the ignorance that frustrates me, but what frustrates me is the, is the, uh, the stereotype that that perpetuates, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, these folks that are in charge of these massive organizations, they have voice, they have influence, they have reach, and their words mean something. So, you know, when the CEO of such a large organization says something like that, it reverberates throughout an entire community. And I'm really glad that people stepped up to kind of give them pushback on that. But I just think if, if I'm a young high schooler that was thinking about, you know, majoring in finance as I was going to college, what, what does that comment mean to me? You know, what, what does that comment mean? So I think being in this space now, I've, I've seen, you know, the, the reception or the receptivity to this idea span the gamut. You have some companies, um, you know, some of which you've already mentioned, you know, some of the companies that, that stepped up to be founding sponsors with the organization, they've been amazing. I mean, as soon as we started the conversation, they were like, man, we are so glad that folks are in this space. Like, where do we sign up? Like, what can we do to help? 
And then unfortunately you have other organizations that would not necessarily come out and say, hey, we don't necessarily believe in what you're doing, but they will kindly find ways to push the agenda down the road to, mm-hmm. to kind of slow roll conversations, um, you know, to kind of wait until, so, you know, it, it's interesting just seeing the range of um, reception that we've, we've seen, but I am, I am so thankful, so thankful for the individuals, for the organizations that have the courage to step up in this space in a very tangible um, actionable way. I mean, it's one thing to get on LinkedIn and make a post. It's, it's something else to get up there and do a hashtag, but but to commit budget, to commit resources, to say, hey, like we understand that there this is a challenge and we want to be a part of the solution. Oh man, that's a blessing of my spirit to see. So mm-hmm. just, just glad to be a part of it. So you said you've only been there uh, for a short period of time. But prior to that, you were still in the same space, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you tell us about that role? Yeah, so right after I graduated from Haas, I I had the privilege of returning to my alma mater, West Point, and working as the Director of Diversity Admissions and Outreach. So from 2016 to 2020, um, I was responsible for coming up with a strategic plan to help increased minority representation at the academy. So um, had a chance to work with some amazing young officers. I had a team of five officers um, that were responsible for different regions of the country. And really our number one job was to really breathe life into young students of color across this country, right? Like we didn't give these students anything that they didn't already have. We didn't go in and wave some magic wand and make them, you know, 4.0 students. Like we literally just came in and said, hey, like we believe in you. And like, you are, you would be a phenomenal candidate for West Point. And you would be surprised how many young men and women out there were just like shocked to hear someone who looked like them say, hey, we believe in you. And we understand this is a top tier school, but we see you being in this space and think you would just crush it. We, I literally remember being on the phone with a candidate, well, we call them candidates, but an applicant, um, and just saying, hey, I'm looking at your SAT scores, I'm looking at your GPA, you've done some great community service, and you're playing sports, like, we would love to have you at West Point, like, mm-hmm. we think you'd be, and the young man literally started crying on the phone, mm-hmm. and Amazing. the crazy, the, you know, the crazy part about this, Mia, is like, what? What I learned from being in that space is unfortunately, um, society has a way of projecting identities and projecting, um, you know, uh, aspirations or a lack of aspirations onto people at a very young age. And not in some whimsical kind of, but in a very like direct way. I mean, there were guidance counselors who were telling these students when they said they were applying to West Point, hey, I don't think you're West Point material. They would literally say that to these young men and women. And, and you know, that was the most frustrating part about that work mm-hmm. were the detractors, you know? Like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand on a personal level what incentive, what motivation there would be for someone to try to tell a young person not to pursue a dream. I'm not saying you don't have, you know, a, 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 an honest conversation about, you know, the challenge that's going to be ahead or, you know, maybe having to take the long road because you may have to shore some things up. But to flat out say that you're not like that, I, I don't understand it. And we spent the majority of our time um peeling back those misperceptions, peeling back those false narratives, peeling back just the layers of gunk that had been poured on to some amazing young men and women. I mean, it was, it was some of the most rewarding work I've done in my life. And that is incredible because so often these kids, they, the wind is removed from their sails very early and they're given a ceiling, you know, to your point, they are just giving a ceiling that's a false ceiling. They don't realize how much they really can achieve with their own given ability and hard work. And you know, go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. 
And that was just one of the, the other pieces that I wanted to talk to you about. How do you help convince these children in this work of diversity and inclusion that, you know what, you have enough. Mm. You have enough. You don't need a magic pill or a magic wand or, or certain things. You have enough based on what you already have, the gifts you already have, and the amount of hard work you've already put into yourself. Mm. So I'm, I'm so glad you went there because that's where I wanted to segue. Um, because I feel like, so I'm actually going to steal a, a page from one of my mentors book, uh, Mr. Marco Lindsay, because he, he actually shared with me something that he was very intentional about doing as he rose to professional success. And really it was, it was, he made an intentional and deliberate decision to remain in the neighborhood that he lives in in Oakland, Right. And one thing that he said when I was at Berkeley, and I'll never forget it, is that, you know, young folks have to see it to believe it, right? Like they have to, to, to see it, they have to see themselves in that aspirational figure to, to, for it to really click on, on, a, on, a, on a deep and meaningful level. And I think that's what's so important about having, you know, black and brown faces in these spaces. It's not, a, it's not just about that individual, but it's about what that individual represents to every single other, you know, person of color that comes behind them. And, you know, as I think about the things that have been most impactful to the young folks that I worked with, it was, I, I had this, I had this hypothesis that if we could get one kid, uh, one Hispanic student, one black student from a high school, if we could just get one, that would open up the floodgates of that program for the next 10 years. Because I've been to high schools in Harlem where they will have the wall of fame and you've got kids that are going to, you know, Cornell. You may have kids that are going to some smaller schools. And then you have that one kid that's going to West Point. And every single time that young man or woman comes back to their school in uniform, that is the best public relations. That is the most aspirational and inspirational mm -hmm. story that you because now they're like oh man I remember when this young man was walking the hallways with me like I I remember having come and like he grew up on the same block that I grew up and if he's doing that you know maybe I can do it mm -hmm. maybe that maybe that can be me so you know I, I think you know the role models are so important and that's why it's important that we have to have, you know, folks in these leadership positions. We have to have the representation because it's not even about this generation. It's about the next generation and the generation that comes behind them too. Yeah, so you mentioned Marco and that's a good segue for us into the program, the Haas program. I'd like to know a little bit more about how Haas prepared you for these roles because these leadership roles are critical right now as we see, as we've just discussed, how did your experience at Haas help you get ready? Mm, Haas, you know, so I feel very fortunate that I've had two transformational educational experiences. Um, coming to West Point was a transformational experience for me in a number of ways. And I feel equally, if not more, Haas was a transformative experience. And I think the, the biggest thing that, that Haas gave me was just a certain sense of confidence that I could be a person that if I had enough passion, if I had enough desire, if I had enough, um, you know, just belief that I could actually bring about positive change in the world, right? right? And it didn't have to be confined to the work that I was doing in, in the uniform. You know, it was, you know, understanding that you're getting a chance to interact with amazing individuals. I mean, my classmates were some of the most fascinating people I've met in my entire life. And to know that you are building friendships and you're building relationships with folks that you can pick up the phone and ask this, what seems to me a very complex question, and now you have someone who can just unpack this idea that's gonna spend the time just encouraging you, motivating you, putting you in touch with the resources, making sure that you have everything that you need to feel confident, comfortable, and moving on to the next step. That was huge. 
So mm-hmm. from an interpersonal level, just the friendships and the relationships were tremendous. But then the other piece that I think was important too was just there were so many um, valuable lessons that I learned in the classroom, um, you know, that gave me um, the intellectual chops, if you will, Mm -hmm. um, to put together a strategy, to to be a strategic thinker. Um, And, you know, coming from a military background, you know, we we, we get a chance to specialize in... so my job in the military, what before I worked in the missions was I was a missile defender. I worked in air defense. So I was hyper-focused in that working in that space. Um, but I didn't know about finance, accounting, real estate, social impact, you know, um, you know, just all of the different levers that can be leveraged to, to bring a vision to life. Hmm. And that's what Haas taught me. Haas taught me that it's one thing to have a dream. It's one, it's an, it's a completely different thing to have a vision that you're going to action on. And oh, by the way, we're gonna teach you how to action on that vision, right? And it was just, I, I, I feel like I was able to learn so much about myself on a deeply personal level. Um, I felt I had no choice mm-hmm. but to go out and um, embark upon tremendously meaningful work after I left that place. So yeah, it was it was basically set set in motion for you once you left the university. I know I'm ready to do this, and the roles that you've taken on have also been critical, as we just discussed that with the military and with Breakline. So I have a question particularly about how you if there you know if there are things or moments that you've come up against where you said you know this is really 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 tough especially as a black man in this space because when you talk about the upper echelons of the military and you talk about the upper echelons of tech we don't see the numbers there yet Mm -hmm. and I know that's Mm -hmm. what we're all working toward but we're they're not there yet what are some of the most difficult experiences you've had and how have you been able to overcome them so far? So I think um, the most difficult experience in recent memory was the, uh, the murder of George Floyd, to be honest with you. And I, I think what was difficult about that was up until that point in my life, I think that the work that I was doing was almost It was almost a nice thing to do, right? Like, it was almost like, yeah, it's cool giving access to opportunity and helping kids out. Like, it's nice to do. Like, after I leave this space, you know, maybe I can do something else. And like, you know, the world's gonna keep spinning, right? Like, it was a nice to do type of thing. Um, But but after what happened, the series of events with George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, you know, Breonna Taylor is here in Louisville, 20 minutes away from my house, right? And I think at that point, it was no longer about a professional decision. It was no longer about like, hey, you know, what should I do with my career? Like as a black man, as a father, as a husband, as a human being, I was like, someday my kids are gonna look back on this moment and they're going to ask, Dad, like, Dad, what did you do? Like in 2020, when like the world was rolling off the hinges and all this stuff, like, what, what, what did you do? Like, where, where were you? Like, what? And that really, that really tugged at my spirit in, in a deep, in a deep and visceral kind of way. And to be very honest with you, transitioning from the military was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make in my life. Mm. The, the military is a very rewarding organization. Um, it clearly gives you a sense of purpose. Um, it, it is very stable and predictable. And there's a lot of goodness that comes from military service. And I do not regret a single day of, of the 12 years I've served in the military. But when that happened and we were listening to Al Sharpton in our living room and he asked, for 
us to stand for a moment of silence for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I had to hold the hands of my wife, hold the hands of my son. And, and my son was holding my daughter's hand. I will never, I'll, I'll never forget that moment mm -hmm. because now it, it's different. It, it's not about, oh man, let me go try to find like this dope ass job that's going to pay me a lot of money or let me just go, you know, see if I can go climb this corporate no man like literally like i i have to dedicate the sum of every bit of energy and life that has been breathed into me to like be a part of the solution in a very tangible way like when people look back at my life i want there to be no question where my intent was and what my goal was to come and make a change in the world no question you're definitely doing that and it's so great to see <clears throat> And so I definitely want to thank you for your time. If there's uh, any parting word that you have for future Haas students and graduates, those who are looking into finding their place in the world right now, please share it now. Yeah, so the last thing that I would leave with is, is, is the reason that, the, 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 the reason that I came to Haas in the first place. And as I looked across the landscape of business schools and programs and just was trying to figure out where I wanted to write the next chapter of my life, what brought me to Haas were the four defining principles. Literally knowing that I was going to go to an institution that was being deliberate and intentional about the culture that they were building, the type of graduates that they wanted to send out to the world, it was, it was by far the most important factor in the decision-making process. And to this day, I will be, I'm, I guess I'm about to be five years removed from graduation. It has not disappointed on that promise yet. And from the classmates to the faculty, to the staff, every single, literally every single person that's associated with this program that I know embodies those principles. And they, we hold each other accountable to, to, to living and espousing to those defining principles. So um, for all the folks that are thinking about Berkeley Haas, that are thinking about where they wanna embark upon this journey, I would just truly, truly encourage you to think about those defining principles because it is not a bumper sticker, it is not a hashtag, it is not you know, a catchphrase. It is something that is woven into the fabric of the institution and um, if that is something that resonates with you, I guarantee you it's going to be a life-changing experience. Well, no more need be said than that. Thank you Come so much. Come on now. 